Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, May 22nd edition of the Basement Academy. Let me just say at the outset, I think today's reflection on the third verse of um, the hymn, The Church's One Foundation, this reflection today, I think you're going to want to listen all the way through. I'm sure I'm going to say some things that is going to cause you to scratch your head and maybe wonder if I'm crazy, and I might be crazy, <laughs> But, but we're going to talk about heresy and schism because that's what the third verse of the hymn does. And I'm going to say some things that you're going to think are maybe not spot on. And so I'm going to ask you to listen or watch all the way through. I'm going to try to keep this to 20 minutes. I'll, I'll do my best. So let's begin with our morning psalm and then let's dive on in. And I think this is an appropriate psalm because it talks about pouring out a complaint before God. David, when he was in a cave, wrote these words. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who know my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to my right and see. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Mm. Such a good psalm. We, we, we've gone through this before, and this is one of my favorite psalms. I pour out my complaint before the Lord. One of the complaints we have as Christians is that people don't believe the right stuff. Those people don't believe the right thing. They don't believe the right thing. They don't, those Christians don't vote the right way. I can't believe those Christians think such and such. One of the complaints we have <laughs> And one of the complaints the world has about the church is that we're divided, that we can't agree, we can't get along. One of my complaints <laughs> is just that. Lord, hear as we pour out our complaint about the church that seems to always want to find a fight, be pick a fight, that we get so committed to a way of seeing something about the end times or something about baptism or something about speaking in tongues or something about human sexuality or something about whatever. And we cannot think of a way we can be in fellowship with people who differ from us. We have many denominations and many of those denominations want to divide into other denominations, right? We're going through a similar struggle right now. And so, so let me read the third verse of um, this hymn, The Church is One Foundation, and let's try to dig into some of these challenges. Though with a scornful wonder we see her, that is the church, sore oppressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Again, love the meter, love the balance, uh, love the rhyme scheme, and love this language of schisms and heresy. I mean, Good grief, we were singing last week about cherubim and seraphim, and now we're singing about schisms and 
heresies. Oh my goodness, what are we doing? Samuel Stone is a local pastor writing a hymn to instruct his church. Thanks be to God, because now the whole church gets to sing this. This is a reflection, a meditation on that phrase of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. And so he wrote 12 hymns to unpack the 12 affirmations or articles of the Apostles' Creed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Samuel Stone. And so he addresses here the reality that the church is distressed, right? She is, uh, uh, the, the, uh, though with a scornful wonder, we see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder by heresies distressed, oppressed and distressed. I pour out my complaint before the Lord that the church is oppressed and distressed. This is a reality. It's not just a modern thing. Stone was writing in the context of a, 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 a distressing heresy of his own day, writing in the 1860s. Uh, one of the Anglican bishops in South Africa had engaged in some pastoral activity that was called into question. He did not require these African polygamists to divorce their wives before they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And he was criticized and disciplined for that. And so it may be that one of the heresies that Samuel Stone has in the backdrop here in his mind is that very reality. We're facing a challenge of our own. So from the beginning, Jesus said, Peter, on your confession <laughs> of of that you are the Christ, the son of the living God on this rock, the confession of Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it or prevail against it. And so the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God have been set upon from the beginning. And so in second Peter chapter two, uh, I'm going to read verses one and two, one of the notes that uh, Samuel Stone offered. This is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. There's that language of being bought, right? Bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. And so that's one of the notes that Samuel Stone made. It's just a reality. People believe all kinds of stuff. The, the, the second line of this, it, 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 let, me, let me say one more thing. Because of the many different kinds of beliefs that we as Christians, not those people, us, right? Because of things that you believe and the way you believe those things, you sometimes do not want to have fellowship with other Christians. That itself may be a heresy. You may be introducing schism. And so I want to talk about those, those words. Now, now uh, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians where Paul writes first in chapter 1, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Now let, me back, let me back up to verse 11. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas or Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. And so in the early church, already something in the human spirit, right? It's our sin. I'm a follower of Paul. Oh, you follow Apollos? I would never listen to him. Oh, you follow Cephas? I follow Christ. And so it's already happening in the early church. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians, later, that, that same letter, uh, chapter 11, verse 18, 
Paul, when writing about the Lord's Supper, he, he starts here. Um, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Wow. Imagine going to church and being told that you're doing more harm than good. <laughs> wow. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it, Paul writes. So he's already written about, he understands that there's these gatherings around this kind of teacher or that teacher. And, and so this is like the early roots of maybe denominationalism, right? And so this line, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Two words that we think we know, but now's when I'm going to say some things that might blow your mind and you might say, gee, I don't know if I can trust Don anymore, okay? Let me start with the word heresy. Heresy typically, traditionally has been understood as a belief that departs from a standard or orthodoxy, right? Right, right belief. And so a heresy is something when somebody chooses to believe something that is not in accord with God's word or that is not in accord with the generally accepted beliefs of the community, right? And so heresy is not just a religious word. You can have, you know, economic policy heresies, it, you know, to, to believe a, a certain kind of monetary policy. You know, what a, what a heretic he is. He departs from, you know, a certain belief. So to depart from a standard is commonly understood to be a, a heretic. Choosing an alternative way of, of thinking or, or believing or doing something. The word heresy itself literally means just to choose. And so when we choose a set of beliefs, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, in the choices that we make, sometimes the schisms result. Schism means to divide. So we, we choose to believe this, and all of a sudden that introduces some tension and maybe some division from the group, right? So we can see heresies and schisms work together. When I was in seminary, I took a class, uh, actually not at my seminary, but we were part of a consortium. And so down at Boston University, uh, Peter Berger, a sociologist, an eminent sociologist, was, was teaching. And I had interacted with some of his thought and his work uh, before. And so to be able to study with him itself. And he talked about what, what he actually wrote up in a book. He talked about the heretical imperative. Sociologically speaking, we live in a pluralistic world where no longer is belief just handed from from one generation to the next. And if you were born into this tribe, you believe all the things of that tribe. The way we would say it is, if your daddy uh, voted Democrat, you would vote Democrat. If your daddy was a Baptist, you would be a Baptist. If your daddy was a carpenter, you would be a carpenter. Once upon a time, you know, we things were just handed from generation to generation and you went into the family business and you believed the way the family believed. Not to do so would be a heretic, right? And it might divide the family. And what Berger was saying is that in the modern world that we live in, with mobility and communication and all of this, the, the heretical imperative, everybody is now forced with the burden of choosing what they believe. Once upon a time, I didn't have to choose it. I just inherited my beliefs from my family. Now we have to choose, and that leads to great mental stress. And so there's a, a, a pastoral reality that sits under this. And so the reality is the church of Jesus Christ has always been filled with heresies. And as a result of that, has always battled with schisms, with divisions. From the beginning, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. In one sense, you could say the denominational reality with thousands of denominations bears witness to some of this because 
this group chooses to believe this about baptism, about the Lord's Supper, uh, about the end times, about speaking in tongues, about human sexuality, about marriage, about uh, whether a child can come to the Lord's table or not. You know, I cannot go as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, I cannot go and take communion at a Roman Catholic church. And so there are heresies and schisms still. We have an understanding that to be a heretic means you are, you're, 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 you're gone from Christianity altogether. And schism is to somehow divide the body of Christ. I don't think it's that way. There is a core of belief that we must insist on. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what we call the Trinity, and Jesus Christ's cross as the central act of redemption, his, his death and resurrection. That is what makes one an orthodox Christian. But there are heterodox Christians. That is, there are those who believe in Jesus Christ but do not believe that he's divine. They believe he's a good teacher. So from the standpoint of historic Christianity, that person might not be an orthodox Christian, but they consider themselves a Christian. So they have chosen a different way of thinking about Jesus. But the church didn't, we didn't inherit the doctrine of Trinity from scripture, right? That word isn't in there. The church had to figure that out. And so the church has always wrestled with these things. Though with a scornful wonder, we see her sore oppressed. By schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. This is the nature of church life. We struggle to agree with one another on many things. We, 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 we're good to agree on a few things. <laughs> this core of salvation and who is God and how does God save. But even that isn't agreed upon. There are some who believe God chooses the elect, the predestined, and others say, absolutely not. You're a heretic. We choose. We're responsible to, to embrace Jesus Christ. And so the Calvinist Arminianist debate has raged for, for centuries, right? And so I want us to think differently. It's not that Somebody who believes different than you is a heretic. You're their heretic, right? They're the one who's orthodox in their mind. You're the one who's the heretic. You're the one who's dividing the body of Christ. Do you ever think of it that way? Of course not. Because we all, this is the curse of, of sin. We always think we're right. I'm right. So if you don't agree with me, well, I'm not wrong. You must be wrong. You must be the heretic. You must be the schismatic. And so I think what, 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 what the hymn is saying is this is the nature of the church. Because when we have differing beliefs, we begin to look at people with suspicion. We begin to divide. We begin to pull back from fellowship. And, and, and then all of a sudden the church is robbed of its joy in Christ. Let's acknowledge we're going to have some different beliefs about these other things. Let's, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, let's pull the oars at the same time and let's do the work of Jesus Christ. Let's proclaim the gospel. Let's invite people into a faith in Jesus' name. And let's acknowledge there are going to be these differing beliefs that we have with a number of people. And let's not let those beliefs divide us. Okay? Now, that's a pastoral reflection on one little line of the hymn. To wrap it up, yet saints their watcher keeping their cry goes up. How long? Uh, the reference in Romans 8.23 is about the groaning of creation. All creation groans until the sons of God or the children of God are revealed. We're part of that groaning creation, part of the struggles that we find in church life with other Christians who love Jesus but believe differently than you do and I do on a few things, that that's part of the groaning of creation, that we somehow think we can't be in fellowship with them and we groan and we rob the church of power and of joy. And so 
uh, the, the, the saints, their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. A reference to Isaiah 51, where uh, the prophet Isaiah writes, the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. One day, the heresies will be gone. The schisms will be gone because we will see clearly and all, we will know perfectly then as we are perfectly known now. Now we see in a glass darkly. One day, that thing that we believe is true and that person doesn't believe is true or the thing that we believe is not true and they believe is true, one, all that's going to get cleared up one day. At some point in time, we're all going to believe the same stuff. <laughs> and the joy of deep fellowship and all the suspicions we have of other Christians who don't believe the way we do, all those suspicions will be driven away and we will embrace one another as Christian sisters and brothers, as friends, and we will not hold people at arm's length which sadly is what we do now. And so I hope this makes sense. I recognize this may be um, challenging to some of you because am I suggesting that somebody who believes a same-sex marriage is right and I'm wrong? No, I actually believe that's wrong. I believe that choice is a heretical perspective from the standpoint of Orthodox Christianity and that heresy, that choice that is made around that belief does bring some sense of tension. And so we have to work hard to make that tension not be a schism, be a division that I refuse to have fellowship with that person. We're tempted to do that from time to time. And so we have to be very careful. I've gone on long enough. What I want to say is I love this line of the hymn because it's so important, but it ends so hopefully that God is at work in the midst. That foundation, the church's one foundation of Christ is unshakable. And for that, we give thanks. Let's take a moment to pray. Gracious God, we bless you and thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ that there is a time coming when we shall be at one fully, completely with all our Christian sisters and brothers. Until then, as we wrestle in the church with the heresies, the alternatives, beliefs, Lord, guard us from being divided and, and being suspicious and holding people at, at arm's length. Would you lead us to a deep abiding unity as we know from these scriptures and sing in this hymn. And so Lord, hear our prayer as we make it in the name of Jesus, our one sure foundation, even as he taught us to pray together saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God grant you a deep abiding heart and commitment to the truth of Jesus Christ and the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May you hold a gracious understanding of those who may differ from you in so many other ways. May he bless you with the joy of Christian fellowship today and forevermore. Amen.